Welcome to the Product Boss Podcast, where we help product-based businesses grow their sales and improve their strategies. Hey, everyone. I want to introduce you to my co-host and biz bestie, Mina Kunlosita, an Amazon guru that has built a multi-six-figure product-based business. In introducing the other half of the product boss, Jacqueline Snyder. She has helped launch and grow over 500 fashion apparel and accessory brands, even one of her own. And together, we share our inventory of secret weapons that will help you dig deep and do the work it takes. Are you ready? Let's build together. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Product Boss Podcast. I'm your host, Jacqueline Snyder, with my efficient co-host, Mina Kula Sitap. Hey, Mina. Hey, everybody. I mean, hey, Jacqueline. (laughs) And everybody. (laughs) So today we are going to talk about losing money. Guaranteed, all of us are losing money in our businesses right now, even if you're making money. And when we have been studying and observing the businesses that we work with, our students, and even our own businesses, we have found five places that you can plug the holes and stop losing money right now and ultimately start making more of a profit once you plug those holes. Right. And that's not to say we're perfect and we we definitely fall prey to these same inefficiencies because they're hard to stay on top of, right? Um, I think that every business, there's a lot of getting, um, you're just in it, right? You're just in it and you don't stop to think, oh, hey, is this a place I should check out to see if I could be saving some money? Right. So these are five places. There are probably more. There's (laughs) probably like dozens. (laughs) And each of our businesses are different and they look differently. But right off the bat, we have seen our students lose money in these five places the most. So you ready to jump in? Yes. So first is shipping. And if you're listening to this episode in 2020, you know that USPS prices went up again. Actually, every year, any year coming up, if you're listening to this, USPS (laughs) prices have gone up again. At least they're still in business. We're supporting the government. (laughs) Right. We are indeed. Um, And so really thinking about that, if in in the different policies too, right? Etsy's really pushed for free shipping. So- there's all these holes of losing money when it comes to shipping that you could look at how can I save instead, right? Do you need to increase the price that you're charging your customer, for instance? Mm -hmm. Do you need to increase the price of your product to cover more of the shipping? Do you need to um, change to different couriers? Like instead of USPS, could you go to FedEx or uh, UPS? Um, do you need to use a regional box versus flat rate? You know, all these different questions that as you start to educate yourself on shipping and how that can be done, you'll be saving yourself money. Right. So for example, if you include shipping in your product, like if you do free shipping and you've kind of built that into your product, you may have to increase the price of your product. Um, or you may have to start charging for shipping. If you have been doing free shipping on orders over $35, you may need to increase it to free shipping on orders over $50. Um, You can always go in and negotiate prices with different places like FedEx or UPS. Um, Something that our top masterminders have is when you get big enough, you actually have a dedicated sales rep at certain ones like FedEx, for example. And then the more you ship, you can actually get commercial rates, right? Right. For FedEx and UPS, you can negotiate your rates. You get a rep no matter what, but I think you get no, you get leverage. Right, right. <laughs> you know, like they don't care if, unless you're shipping out um, if they're going to give you a better deal. For USPS, um, there's always that commercial versus that retail rate too. So people off the street, just like at FedEx and UPS, they're paying a different rate, right. you know? And so a way to do that is 
is to get on different software. For us, I always recommend Shipping Easy. It costs $30 a month, but guaranteed you're saving $30 of time. And that's the thing. We love Shipping Easy and we will put a, a link in the show notes because we love them so much. We right. became, I want to do like a free training on it too. Yeah. Eventually. Like we decided to become affiliates with them because we love them so much. So right. I use them for low labels. They are so great. Customer service, pricing, you get the automatic commercial rate. And they integrate the platforms for you. So you have one place that you have to go to for all the places that you might be shipping. So if you're on multiple platforms and you're selling in multiple sales channels, they integrate into this one place. So when we're also talking about losing money, time is money. If you guys are shipping yourself, if you are wearing all the hats in your business, well, time is money, right? We need to save you more time so you can be doing those high dollar tasks. If you're paying someone to fulfill for you, if you're paying someone to ship your product, same thing. Like how can you make it more efficient for them? So I think there's the idea of what you're paying for shipping. There's the Mm. cost of the materials to ship. Right. Even through shipping easy, you can buy your, not buy, you can have the materials sent to you. So those flat rate boxes, that are free, all of those can be sent to you through that platform, the Shipping Easy platform. So you don't even have to go into the post office or you don't even have to go to USPS.com, right? Right. You save money on boxes, for instance, because you're using their boxes. Um, So when you're thinking about those materials, you could save money that way as well. Right. So shipping is one of those places that we want you guys to look at and see how you can become a little bit more efficient in it, streamline Mm -hmm. it, and see where you could either negotiate prices or find a different carrier, somebody that's going to help you uh, reduce reduce your costs or that you need to start building it more into your margins. Right. Um, second place that you could be plugging up some holes is inventory. Inventory. Yeah. And this is inventory on the shelves, right? What do you have sitting there that could be made into cash, basically? Right. And so a lot of times, a lot of you are making product and then selling it, right? Versus the other way that sometimes people are, you know, selling their product wholesale, they're getting purchase orders against their orders, and then they go to production so they know what they've actually already sold. But a lot of you have just been making product. And so inventory eats up a lot of cash, Are you looking at your numbers? Are you looking at the data? Are you just sort of making things willy-nilly because you like it? Or are you saying like, wow, my customers really like this scent or this color and I'm going to lean more into the stuff that sells really well and lean out of or put on sale the stuff that's not selling and make some money on it? Yeah. And I want to add a different thing to this inventory. It saves time, money, and space, right? There's lots of people that pay storage, for instance, or they have a room dedicated to inventory in their house, and that eats up at their brain clutter and their the space that they even have to live in in their own house, right? So um, sometimes it's long-term storage fees. In this case, it's not. But it's really about that whole idea of inventory and how that's making you lose time, money, and space. Right. Are you making stuff because you like it, but your customers haven't told you that they like it with their dollars or with sales? Another thing to think about to the other side of inventory is, could you be buying certain things in bulk to get a better price on it? So if you're making soap or candles and you buy wax or whatever your base Mm -hmm. materials are for it, if you were able to buy more of it in bulk and batch your production, then that, then you're spending less on that like cost of raw materials to go into the inventory that you're making or you're sitting on it and that money is spent, but you're not piecing it out like one by one by one. Right. Even where you buy stuff from, right? I think that this is one of those things where you think of technology and technology is so rapidly changing that there's different manufacturers that come up. Like for instance, back in my day, there used to only be, um, oh, why is my brain not working right now? The a four color press uh, for printing. Um, what is that called? I can't even remember, but now there's digital, right? Right. And so before you had to take it to press and that was expensive. Now it's digital where it can, you to the normal eye, the process is so much easier, faster, and cheaper. Right. And smaller quantities can be accomplished. Right. And so that's something that as technology changes or as different manufacturers pop up or different um, 
design techniques or machine, you know, innovations come up, then it, or industry trends, let's say, that's when you need to think about, okay, how is this changing my product? And do I want to think about that in my raw goods or my finished product? So I like that you bring that up because it's a flip side of kind of what I was talking about that. For example, uh-huh. you may be able to make less, like certain uh-huh. technologies, you may be able to have less inventory on hand that you might be paying more per piece than you would if you bought more of them. But maybe you don't sit on all that inventory because it's still money spent And so a lot of times when we coach our students, we're talking to them about, you know, minimum viable products. So if you're bringing something new on, maybe you're not making tons of them where cash is spent and shelf space is taken up and you're making fewer of them. You've paid more per piece, but it's less in like the all around. There's less of it for you to sell. Right. So the third place that you might be losing money right now that you might want to plug that hole is labor. Yes. We don't mean, you know, labor. (laughs) I mean, we mean labor. We do mean labor. But like some of, I know that we've said this sometimes. I know that is an odd word for me because I don't think of them as my labor force. Right. Um, And so when Jacqueline and I were thinking about all these five areas, we kind of went back and forth on this word. Mm -hmm. So it's it's got a lot of slashes. (laughs) Slash employee, slash, you know, team. Right. Slash manufacturer (laughs) slash you. (laughs) So the labor that goes into making the products happen. Right. And so where are the holes that you're draining money? One of the things I can think of the top of my head that people don't think about a lot is having people in the wrong roles. Right. And we see this so much in the top mastermind. Uh, where there needs to be some shifting that happens because they have lots of labor. They have lots of team members. Right. And sometimes they're just not in the right role. Right. And then the other thing with like with labor or employees or you, when we go back to shipping, you know how I mentioned, you know, that it's, it's money that you're spending on somebody shipping and fulfilling for you or you doing it and not having these like streamlined processes. It's the same thing. So you could be, If you are not managing an employee in the right way, or even your own time, your own time management, and you're not batching things, it might be taking you longer that you're per hour, like what you're paying yourself per piece is just, it's not, it's not matching up. And then also contractors, like Mina was saying before, like, can you, can you shop things around and get a contractor or someone who's going to manufacture your product? at a, at a cheaper price, like in labor, you can always shop things around and then you have to weigh it out. Mm -hmm. And, and is there too much overlap in the roles that you have? That's another one outside of people being in the wrong roles. Sometimes there's too many people doing the same thing, right? Or sometimes there's not enough. So maybe it's about, you know, this person works on shipping and all they do is seal boxes, Mm -hmm. right? Think about a warehouse, how that works. And there's usually, it's like a factory line. It's like, tape the box, tape the box, tape the box. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's not like pick pack and all those things, right? And I think sometimes we see that people want people to do this themselves, Mm -hmm. like come up with these streamlined processes that are going to make their their hours more efficient that you're paying them for. But you guys have to realize that you as the owner of your business, sometimes you may have to set up these systems or these processes and establish these like systems of operation or SOPs as we call them to make sure that it is, it's happening the way that you see it, right? You might walk in and be like, Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why are you packing individual boxes, like mm-hmm. building With the box? With packing ple- peanuts, you know we're a green <laughs> company. And like you're building the box and then going and putting the product in the box and printing out the label and, and sealing the box instead of like building all the boxes at once. Right. And then, you know, filling the boxes and mm-hmm. then printing the labels, like batching out your time. So, so I think we assume sometimes that people have that foresight, but when you hire somebody, um, they may not. If they do, yay, bonus to them as an employee. And mm-hmm. it might even be for yourself where you, you're you not seeing the holes in your own processes and sometimes working with coaches or with a community or having, you know, um, friends that are in the same type of industry or like this like community that we're building, that they're able to kind of point that out and be like, well, I do it like this. And you get to learn from them. Right. I want to bring up a, a example um, because this kind of falls into shipping as well. But I get a lot of messages from Amazon customers, which is so funny because 
Amazon fulfills my orders, right? And they're like, why don't you put these into smaller boxes? Mm -hmm. And I always say, well, I hear you on that. I wish that they would, but Amazon fulfills for us and I let them know that. But here's the thing. Amazon does not have a million sizes of boxes. You know why? Because they're going to production on a million of one size of box and it fits what's ever in that range. You know, it's not like, oh, this is the perfume size. This is the, you know, book size. This is the other size because then there's all these different sizes of boxes. So thinking about that, like when you're thinking about somebody's role, they do this range of roles, but they have to, um, like what you said, systemize it, uh, tape up all the boxes at once. Um, call the, call USPS beforehand to have them pick up instead of us having to drop off. Things like that, that they won't know unless um, those standard operating procedures happen to be there. So when you guys are hiring or you have your team or you're doing it all yourself, but you hope and plan to hire one day, observe, observe the labor, observe what you're doing as it's going into it and write it down. Like start to create systems and efficiencies. And the coolest thing is, is when you do end up hiring people, if you hire the right people, they will actually improve your systems. They might even say like, Hey, I found this better way of doing it. And that's the thing that's going to sort of set you up for success that every single time you're able to add somebody or add something that improves the system with your labor or you are able to shop around pricing on something and find a better manufacturer that has lower costs and better minimums, you're going to improve something and you're ultimately going to save money in the long run. Right. And retraining is such a hole too, like of losing money. So I think that labor is a huge one because you have the potential to lose a lot of money and putting the people, like what you said, in the right spots, in the right places, if you find the right person, they can prevent even more uh, money being lost. And they always say, hire slow, fire fast, um, and just make sure to keep your eye on your business. When it's a small business, you guys have to keep your eye on it until until you're able to fulfill like a management position to oversee that. Right. So then number fourth place that you might be losing money right now in your business is actually in your pricing and your margins. <sighs> Deep sigh. Deep sigh for Nina. I do not enjoy talking about pricing. It is not my love language. And I do. <laughs> <laughs> I get a thrill. And But I do think that you can lose a lot of money with pricing wrong because it's also on the other flip side of that is the positioning that happens when you price a certain way. Yeah. So we see this a lot of the lot of you because, you know, our community is mixed with people who are makers and people who are manufacturing a product, which means that they are still product-based businesses, but they're not actually making, like Mina's not printing her labels at home. She has manufacturers printing them and, and she's running the business, right? Versus we have people making um, pottery or jewelry at home mm-hmm. and they're, they're still physically with their hands or with employees hands making their product. So pricing, I think one of the biggest things that I see an issue here is typically usually actually goes back to labor. If you're a maker, a lot of you, I bet, are not pricing correctly for labor in your business. So oftentimes makers, so many times people are like, oh, I don't actually charge for labor. So like mm-hmm. they'll charge for like the cost Or they'll of be like $8,600 for this knit hat. <laughs> 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 or they'll be like $8 for this knit hat, but it took me 17 hours to knit it. I know, both sides yeah. of the spectrum. So the thing is, is that I want you guys to think about like your pricing does have to include labor. And it's easiest when I'm coaching our students on this by saying to them, if you were to hire somebody into this role, what, how long would it take them to do it? And what would you be paying them per hour? And that's the labor I want you to build into it. But not just one, right? If you hire somebody and they were to batch out, let's say 10 of them could be, the, let's say the ideal 10 per one, hour. 10 per hour, how much would that end up costing you? Right. Right. It's not like, how much does it cost them to make one by one by one? Right. So let's go with an easy, easy math number here for us. So let's say you're paying somebody, I'm going to just say $20 an hour because 10 feels too low. So mm-hmm. let's say you're paying somebody... $20 an hour to knit hats for you, and they can knit 10 of them. That means that your labor is $2 mm-hmm. per hat because they can make 10, 
it's $2 a hat, build that in. You yourself may not be paying yourself anything per hour, but you need to think about if I were to be able to replace myself with with somebody who would be doing this and what would their yield be? When you hire a contractor and they're pricing it out for you, they're asking themselves the same questions as they're giving you the pricing with their margin. So I think that's one thing that I always see there's a mistake in that, that people aren't accounting for their labor. Mm -hmm. They're not accounting for their cost of their raw materials. Mm -hmm. Um, They're not accounting sometimes for a slight overhead charge into it. Um, And then I think a mistake that people do sometimes is that they're like, they're adding in too much for shipping Mm -hmm. and like things that shouldn't be added that like certain things are like cost of doing business or paid on the outside of it. Yeah. And then also when you think about it, I guess it goes both ways because I've seen people charge a lot for them having to drive to Michael's, you know, to buy that yarn for the knitted hat, for instance. Right. right? But what if they didn't go to Michael's every time and they just ordered it online? Right. You know, what's the difference there? You know, so I think there's lots of different factors when it comes to pricing. So, you know, we, we, one of the first things we teach about in multi shoe machine is pricing mm-hmm. and how to price. And we actually have a cost sheet and we work through it because there are lots of little tiny details, I think, that go mm-hmm. into pricing your product. And when it's you yourself making it, it's hard sometimes, or you're making things in small batches, it's hard to find the right margins. But if anything, we want you guys to know your true costs and your true cost of labor. So at least you know where you stand. And then you could say, for example, when I'm coaching clients, I ask them, well, what do they want it to sell for? Mm -hmm. So um, here's an example. I have a client that sells leggings for $110, but her cost was really high to make it. It was like 40 bucks and it did not allow enough room for her to have wholesale and Mm -hmm. then retail. Like her margin was was off. So we backed into that number. We were like, okay, well, we're selling them for 110. That's what we think people are going to sell it for. What do we need to bring our costs down to you so that it actually would have the right margin to sell it at 110? So even though when you're first starting, you may have these weird off margins, eventually we want to make sure that like long-term it's realistic that you could. Because Mm -hmm. for example, if the fabric is $40 and that's like what she's spending in fabric, she would never be able to sell them at 110. And we know that her pricing is, is wrong. But if it's a small, small batch, then it's just for now as she builds her business and able to make more of them. Right. I think there's two things. So right now, if you're thinking about your pricing, you should know your cost of goods, like what you said, but also know your capacity. Right. So you know that when you're hiring people on, you can't expect them to churn out 20 when you're only yourself churning out 10 as an expert. Right, right. So pricing is a pricing something that I think is one of the biggest questions we get from our students. And it's something that I think is one of those first things like in multi shoe machine where we see like, when people come into the group, like, right, that's one of the very first things that they're like, Oh, my goodness. But the price is the price is the price, though. Yeah. Because the thing is, though, they can charge whatever if it is allowed, right? Because some people are like, well, it costs me however much to make this. And let's say you caught put in the labor it ends up being $14. And they're like, but people are buying it at $85. That's amazing. Right. Keep selling it at $80. Right, 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 you know? right. But I think one of the things that they see is like they see the holes where they're all of a sudden like, oh my goodness, I wasn't charging enough for this. Or, Mm -hmm. oh my goodness, I need to get my costs down because I'm losing all of this money because I like, I can't even, there's people and I'm, and that are like, yeah, I sell this for $15 and I'm making $2 for everyone I sell. Uh It's like, why are you selling it if you're only making $2? (laughs) Like it's not a charity. This isn't a hobby. Right. So we really want you guys to get like the appropriate margins and pricing so that you are making money on your product. Otherwise, you're really just like, I like to knit and I have an exchange with people and I get to make $2 a piece. That's not that's not how you build a business. Right. So the last way that you might be losing money in your business is customer care. And this one is a big one because remember that your existing customers are so much easier than that first initial purchase. So your existing customers are the ones that are going to buy from you nine times more likely they'll buy from you again than somebody off the street, right? Than that cold traffic, quote unquote. So when you think about that, you want to do the best that you can in the customer care. So are you losing money to returns? Are you losing money to people that are complaining about 
some certain feature? Are you losing money because people are not, they don't know how to use your product? Um, so there's a customer care and follow up that happens. I guess before, during, and after, but I do think that it's most important for after. Right. And customer retention. And I mean, that's why we teach about like content and showing up Mm -hmm. for your customers. And we really lean into like, just because you make the sale, you can't abandon those people. Like that's the engagement that you need to keep going because they also have to be seen and heard. But if, if there's something that's wrong, like, and you see it coming up, you know, we all get those weird reviews that you're like, mm-hmm. that person was having a bad day. And for some reason, today is the day. <laughs> Today's the day they're going to let you know. <laughs> so there's that. But then there's also, if you see something consistently coming up, like, for example, like five people are like, I got my box and it was ripped open and mm-hmm. um, the product inside was damaged. Well, maybe the box you bought was really cheap. And there's something that you need to take care of with that. Or if a lot of people are returning something and they're saying like the size is too small or something, uh-huh. then you need to be like, oh my goodness, and then address that and perhaps fix it by sending them a, a bigger size and be like, oh, we have to look at our sizing. Right. And and really addressing that. But here's the thing too. You can see with every single one of these examples, the way to prevent you from losing money in all these holes is by systems and processes and policies. For customer care – Having your policies, your refund policy, your shipping policy, your exchange policy, having it all clearly written out and ready to go is how you save money because you already know what people are going to ask you. You already know um, if you know an exchange is allowed. You already know that that's the best way to take care of your customer because you know about your product. Right. I think just systems in general, it's like something that we teach. And and when we talked about like standard operating procedures or the systems you're using for shipping or the way that you track your inventory, all of these ways are the ways that you're going to be more efficient and build a business that's not just like, you know, maybe it was built out of your basement or your kitchen. And then as you build it, all of this stuff has to get put in place to plug those holes and stop losing money. Because you guys, if you had a ship and it was sinking because there were holes, you start plugging those holes and the water comes out and the sink, the ship starts to rise, right? And it floats and it survives. And that's what we want for you because maybe right now your business would be profitable if, or more profitable if some of these holes were plugged and some of these systems were improved and they were a bit more efficient. Yeah, for sure. Plugging all the holes are essential because when you think about it, when you're scaling your business, sure, you might be able to scale. Let's say you're scaling it bigger, but sometimes if you have these holes, you're scaling that hole too. Right. You know, so the hole is becoming bigger, but, and then that's when it gets away from you. Right. So that's why we want to make sure that this is kind of, (laughs) what do I say for systems? I can't remember. Not fun, but necessary. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's like it's not the sexy part of business yeah. necessarily. I mean, some people might think it's like super fun. There's people that are really into systems, uh-huh. and other people are like, wow, I have to build these systems. But then it feels so good when those systems are built. I like attribute it to like when you organize your spices or mm-hmm. like or like your pantry or like your sock drawer, and all mm-hmm. of a sudden you're like, wow, I can find all of my socks, mm-hmm. you know? And it's kind of the same thing in each of these areas. So, like we said in the very beginning of the podcast. There might be more places in your business to look at, but these five places are some of the places that we've seen the biggest holes. And once our students have plugged them, we've seen the greatest of improvements and um, opportunities presented to them where they were definitely able to, like Mina said, scale and not scale the hole, grow and make more money. Yeah. So... Thank you for joining us on this. If you want to connect with us more, connect with us on Instagram and we can't wait to help to continue to support you. Right. And let us know if there's any other systems that you think of that you um, love or don't love in your business. And we would love to hear that. Thanks everybody. This episode is over, but it doesn't have to end. Head over to our Facebook group, search for the Product Boss Biz Community, or the link is also in the show notes. Come connect with other product bosses just like you. We'll see you in there. If you love the Product Boss Podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, share, rate, and give a review on iTunes. Until next time, product bosses, let's make it happen.